Uh, tonight's lesson uh, is going to be on uh, two of the Hasmonean, uh, or the two of the Maccabean brothers, Hasmonean brothers, however we want to say it. Um, and we're going to reach the point where the, the five brothers of the original family that rebelled, uh, they're, they will all be now off the scene and we'll move on to their descendants next week and, and cover what happened um, with their descendants in, in the weeks to come. So uh, last week, just as a matter of review, um, and about, uh, so first, uh, and give me a heads up, I'll try to keep an eye out here if, it, if the sun is starting to reflect on this too bad for any of you. Um, but first what we have is just a review of the revolt that we went over last week. So Antiochus the Force, the Fourth, yeah, the Force, the Force, uh, Antiochus the Fourth uh, is the Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, who is the one who tries to force the Jews to become Hellenized uh, and uh, appoints priests that will help him do that. Uh, and then eventually, as they're doing all of that forcing, the, the priest uh, family, Mattathias, uh, he resists the Greeks. And when he resists the Greeks, the uh, rebellion rises up with them uh, and uh, ends up starting a revolt. So Judas is the first leader of the rebellion. We talked about him uh, last week. Jonathan is the second leader, and we're going to be talking about him this week. Eliezer was killed early in the rebellion, and so he, he just, during one of the battles that they had. John, we're going to learn about this week as to what happened to him, but he ends up dying uh, in an encounter with the Nabataeans. Uh, have you ever seen the pictures of the city Petra? That's the Nabataeans. Uh, and then Simon is the third leader, um, and he ends up uh, being the, the, the last of them, which the irony of that is he was appointed the head of the family at the death of his father, but he ends up being the last of the brothers uh, to leave. Judas is where we stopped last week. He, the success that he had against the Greeks uh, basically won a lot of control over the area of Jerusalem and Judea. Um, that control kind of waxed and waned with the political situation. Uh, and eventually when the Greeks come in in one of those waning periods, he dies gloriously in battle, taking 800 guys out to meet like 10,000. So uh, that is how we left it last week. This week, actually before I do this week, I'm going to go ahead and close the door. So this week, we're going to be covering Jonathan, and Jonathan is referred to as Jonathan the Diplomat. Uh, and the reason why he has that moniker is because he expands the Jewish kingdom to a pretty great extent, uh, and he, um, he does so, they're, they're the kingdom of the influence, simply through choosing the right side in battles over the throne of the Syrian uh, or the Seleucid Empire. And so through his diplomatic efforts, he ends up gaining uh, a lot of control of the area. So Jonathan the diplomat, after the death of Judas, uh, he ends up being asked by the Jews uh, to be able to lead what was then the rebellion. And he decides to go ahead and do that. Uh, but meanwhile, Bachitz, uh, who is the Seleucid general, he tries to capture him before that can happen. Uh, and so Jonathan and his brothers, they flee uh, to Tekoa, which is near Bethlehem, just south of Jerusalem. So you can see there Jerusalem, the arrow going, so that's where the arrow, first arrow stops, that's about where Tekoa was. When they're at uh, Tekoa, he sends his brother John to store their supplies with the Nabataeans. So now that they have a lot of, you know, there's the food, there's, there's different money, there's things that they would have for paying people and, and those that would be in the revolt, how to, uh, and they don't want it out where it's easy to be captured. By sending it to the Nabataeans, it's in a different area that the Greeks would not want to go into because it would start a whole nother war. And so when he sends them, uh, John, in to, to Nabatea to do that, there's a tribe of the Nabataeans who wanted to make money off of them, so they captured John, uh, hoping to have uh, uh, money, and then they end up uh, just killing him. And so John is killed, and then you have 
um, the the rebels saying that's it we're going to go uh, um, <clears throat> repay them so he goes into Nabatea and he hears that there's this big wedding celebration that's going on and so they end up uh, attacking the this wedding uh, celebration and steal a great deal of supplies that they had because the Nabateans had stolen all of their supplies uh, which then creates a little bit of negativity between them and uh, the Nabateans. Um, while they're attacking and they're out doing that, the Greek Hellenizers that are in the area of Jerusalem contact uh, Bachides, uh, Bachides, I guess I'll, I'll go with that pronunciation, uh, and they, when they contact Bachides, they're like, look, Jonathan's out of his camp, he's over by the Nabateans, it's a great time to come and attack him. Uh, and what you're going to find is that throughout this entire time, the Hellenized Jews are consistently contacting the, the Greeks, saying, this is a great time to attack them, this is a great time to attack them, and that's actually going to backfire them on them eventually, because the Greeks are going to come out and have enough failures that they're going to be like, sorry, no, we're not going to do that anymore. Um, so when they, the Greeks do come out uh, to uh, attack them, uh, they attack on the Sabbath, but Jonathan's forces still uh, fight back, but they are overwhelmed, and so they have to swim the Jordan to the other side, and they're able to escape. Uh, so Bakides then, as a result, turns back to Jerusalem, fortifies Jerusalem, and strengthens it with a garrison uh, so that he's able to um, uh, control Jerusalem. And then he takes hostages from the ruling families in Jerusalem, puts them into the Acre, which is the fortress that's right next to the temple. And by having those hostages of the ruling families, now if Jonathan comes back in and rebels, there's this order that they could take the, the hostages' lives, and that would be the children of the ruling family. So it's kind of an effort to undermine their support for Jonathan. So then uh, Alchemist, uh, who's uh, the Greek-appointed high priest, uh, he ends up dying, uh, and uh, he had been um, he had been emboldened by Bakide's uh, success in taking on Jerusalem, uh, and then he goes in and he seeks to tear down the inner wall of the temple sanctuary. Now, this inner wall of the temple sanctuary is is something that it is attributed in the Maccabees as having been um, there due to the prophets. It's thought that maybe this inner wall was the wall that you had the signs on that no Gentile could go beyond that. Uh, if you look at the design that was given by God on Mount Sinai for uh, um, for the, the tabernacle, there is no court in which Gentiles are not allowed to enter, per se, uh, if, especially if they have been converted. There's the court of Israel, but they don't set up a separate wall and even when Solomon sets up the temple it does not seem to have a separate wall uh, that on which Gentiles couldn't go by and it's thought maybe that during the time of the prophets because of the tendency of the Jews to mix with Gentiles that uh, as a result of some of the prophets they decided to build this wall well Alchemist because he is in favor of the Greeks and opening up the everything to the Greeks and being more open to their culture it would make sense that he would want to get rid of this wall that offended them, that you can't even get this close, you know, because you're not uh, Jewish. So he tries to take down that wall, uh, and it's recorded that when he does, he struck mute and dies. Uh, so whether he had a stroke or something, but he just, while he's in the process of doing that, uh, he dies. Uh, and at that point, the Seleucid king, Demetrius, fails to replace him. So there's no high priest in Jerusalem, so there's no specific... Jewish ruler in Jerusalem as a temple state. Um, and this opens the door then uh, for uh, Jonathan to then be appointed that. So when Alchemist dies, uh, during this time period, there's about two years where just nothing happens. So there's two years of peace uh, for the Jews. And then at this point, the Hellenizers uh, convince the king that Jonathan can be easily captured. So they're kind of sitting back, why are they not doing anything? Jonathan's right here. He could be doing it. So I want you guys to think about, uh, and I know this isn't the best picture, but 
you know, it's like you had Bin Laden who was able to escape the authorities for so much, and it's like it, all of a sudden, you know, there's a year, two-year period where nothing's really happening. They're like, well, we all know he's right here. Come and get him. And that's kind of how uh, this was seen because he was a rebel. And so uh, they convince uh, um, the king to send somebody. So he sends uh, Bakides, and he comes to capture Jonathan, and he wants to just end the revolt. But then Jonathan comes out and actually defeats Bakides. Uh, and when he defeats Bakides, rather than like you know seeking to have more and all this other stuff, he stops and he sues for peace. So he's like, hey, you don't want to keep fighting us. We don't want to keep fighting you. Let's just have peace and have an agreement. So this is the start of Jonathan the diplomat as he makes all of these agreements with these different rulers. So Bakides agrees to this treaty with Jonathan, and he was mad at the Hellenizers for continuing to involve him, and he was so mad that he actually had 50 of them killed, of those that said, come and get Jonathan, uh, because he came down and ended up uh, losing. Uh, and then he, uh, he also uh, allows Jonathan then to be uh, uh, free from conflict and, and rule over Michmash. Now, does anybody remember from the Old Testament uh, kind of the irony of Jonathan ruling for Michmash? Mm -hmm. So this is where Saul set up his first, well, oh, it's, no. it's where he set up his first government, Michmash and Gibeah. Saul was in Gibeah, and Jonathan, his son, ruled in Michmash. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's Jonathan of, of this group ruling in Michmash, uh, and now he's ruling in Michmash. Now, Michmash is, is only a couple miles north of Jerusalem. It's very close to Jerusalem. Uh, so the people in Jerusalem, you know, he, it, it's putting him very close to there. Um, then, uh, so at this point, you have the, the uh, Alexander Ballas, uh, and he seeks to supplant Demetrius I. So the Syrian, or the Seleucid kingdom in the north, is falling apart at this point. It's the, you're, as we go through this, you're going to see, you're, you're going to get just weary of this king and this king. Which Demetrius is this? Which, which uh, Alexander is this? Which one is this? Don't try to, you don't need to remember all of them, okay? I don't know too many that would remember all of them. What you want to pick up from going through this is just how often it's switching and and what's happening with Jonathan choosing the right sides. So don't try to remember like Alexander Ballas and Demetrius the first or the second or the third or the sixth or the eighth and so on and so forth. <laughs> so Alexander Ballas, uh, he seeks to supplant Demetrius the first and he, he was the son of Antiochus the uh, fourth uh, and he takes Ptolemaeus and claims the right to the throne. So, uh, so uh, Antiochus IV is Antiochus Epiphanes. So he's the son, and at this point then fairly, an older son, but a, a son of Antiochus IV. And he goes to Ptolemaeus, which is, uh, um, oops, let me forward our slide here. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay, so Ptolemaeus is up there on, on the, um, just the north of the, the little peninsula that is Carmel. Uh, and so he parks there and starts to rule. Now, the king of the Seleucids, he's reigning in Antioch, which is all the way up almost to Turkey. It's actually technically in modern-day Turkey, but it's that part of Turkey that kind of dips around uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And so you have two rulers competing at this time. Um, and so with these two uh, rulers uh, competing, uh, you have Demetrius who comes to Jonathan and, um, actually wait, sorry, Alexander Ballas, the son of Antiochus, he takes uh, Ptolemaeus and then he's backed by Rome and Egypt. Uh, Demetrius then is like, I need Jonathan's help to fight against him, especially since Jonathan is actually close to Ptolemaeus. Uh, and so he offers these favorable terms to Jonathan uh, if Jonathan will send troops to fight for him. So he gives him the right to build and equip an army. Uh, so he's now allowed to make weapons. He won't get in trouble if that's the case. He's starting to stockpile them and such. Uh, and then the hostages that they had in the fortress in Jerusalem, in the Acre, are released. So that allows the leaders of, of Jerusalem to get behind him. They don't have fear of their own kids' Uh, lives being taken. So then, 
when Demetrius is trying to court uh, Jonathan's favor, Alexander Ballas comes in and says, well, I'll court him for favor too. So he offers the same rights as Demetrius, plus the high priesthood, uh, which has, again, has not been filled yet. Uh, and he, he offers his high priesthood to Jonathan uh, himself. Now, Jonathan becoming a high priest was actually something that was, couldn't just be done because he was not part of the Aaronic line of the priesthood. Uh, and he, was, he wasn't uh, even, and he definitely was not from the Zadok line that had been the tradition since uh, the time of David. Um, but he gets appointed as this. Jonathan wisely, though, does not just simply accept this. He t ends up taking it uh, to the people as we're going to see. So he's officially made high priest in 152 BC. Uh, and then he's proclaimed a friend of the king, uh, and he's put it in purple robe and a crown. So he's not taking the title of king, but by being friend of the king, he's being put in as the ruler of Judea. And then Alexander Ballas makes him governor of, of Judea in 150 BC, which makes it even more official that he's governing that whole area. Uh, and then Demetrius comes back and offers, you know, all of this stuff. You get to do this, you get to do this, you can be this. And it's, it's so extreme that, that Jonathan is like, yeah, you're, you're not going to follow through on that. And uh, uh, so I'm not going to accept it. So he's wise enough. You know, he, at first he accepted Demetrius' offer. Alexander counter offers. Demetrius' counter offer was too good, so he doesn't accept it. And in that wisdom, uh, he ends up gaining because Alexander Ballas ends up defeating Demetrius I. And so he makes a treaty uh, with, with Ptolemy, the king of Egypt, and marries uh, the king, the king of Egypt's daughter, making him even more powerful at that point. And because he had stuck with uh, Alexander, Jonathan then gets exalted and gets uh, and is given more control. So he's invited to join the king of Egypt and Alexander up in Ptolemais. And when he gets there, there are Jews that are are um, the the Hellenized Jews that are really mad that these rebels. Are, have gotten to a point of prominence where now they're being recognized uh, in this way. And so they go to complain against Jonathan and try to remind him, hey, this is the guy that rebelled against you guys. You guys don't want him being the one to rule. But when Jonathan gets there, he, he gets there and he has a whole bunch of gifts. You'll, you'll find out gifts go a long way back in this day. So he has a whole bunch of gifts that he gives to them. Uh, and... Uh, when, when he's, he's there, all of those Jews that are accused, before they even get a chance to see the king, they see Jonathan already being honored, already being put in positions of authority, and they actually flee because they're afraid that they're going to be put to death uh, if anyone hears why uh, they were there. So then, uh, Demetrius II uh, goes to Antioch to claim the throne. Uh, and so Demetrius II, I believe is the son of Demetrius I, uh, he... Uh, says, no, I'm not going to accept Alexander Ballas. I'm going to be the one uh, for the throne. And Jonathan fights valiantly, valiantly against the forces of Demetrius and defeats them uh, and takes one of the cities along the coast. And so Alexander uh, honors him all the more. So here Jonathan is one of the main ones propping up and, and, and helping uh, Alexander Ballas uh, to uh, stay in control. I'm probably surpassed this. So I forgot here. So... When make Jerusalem, he's given control of that area. And then, uh, yeah. So here, at this point, when he's exalted, he's even given control out to Joppa, um, uh, where now they have an actual port city to start doing trade with. That does not stand the whole time. Uh, but now you have Demetrius II uh, coming. And uh, he, uh, Demetrius the, the II, um, basically, Ptolemy of Egypt helps to overthrow Alexander, and then he dies as well. Like, why would he do that? Because he gave his daughter to them. But that was part of the conflict, is that uh, the way the daughter came in, he was, she was supposed to help control more things, and that didn't help. And so Egypt actually helps Demetrius II to win. And then you have great unrest that follows uh, uh, as the various armies fight each other in the city. So basically, in the entire area... Um, you end up having an upheaval, and there's no one really uh, for sure governing. So during this conflict, since nobody's going to come and pay attention to what you're doing, 
Jonathan lays siege to the Acre, which is the fortress in Jerusalem, to try to get the garrison that's in there out of Jerusalem and hoping that they will be too distracted uh, to be able to uh, actually do anything about it. Uh, but when he does this, Demetrius demands an explanation and calls Jonathan, you need to come and tell me why were you attacking the Acre and why were you doing that? So he just shows up again with a bunch of gifts. Uh, and when he brings all the gifts in response to those gifts, Demetrius is like, oh, we're all good buddies again. And so he ends up confirming all of the honors that were given to Jonathan. Uh, he reduces taxes even further of what's required in Judea, and that even has some benefits for Samaria. Uh, and then he increases the territory of, of Judah. Now, again, this is why Jonathan is called Jonathan the Diplomat. I mean, you have all these times when you think he'd be getting in trouble, and he just he knew how to show up with the right amount of gifts and 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 just turn things around and and it, it couldn't have just been gifts there had to be a personality that was there that was able to talk uh talk the talk uh with these people um then you have tryphon who is alexander's general uh he revolts against demetrius uh the second and he tries to take control jonathan then provides aid to demetrius the second uh, and as a result, as a favor, the Greek garrison is just removed from the Acre, so he doesn't even have to fight against it. He doesn't have to uh, go in and do anything because they, they just um, retreat. Jonathan and his Jewish forces, uh, at, during this time, heroically save uh, King Demetrius' life, but then King Demetrius goes back on his word. So when Demetrius goes back on his word, Jonathan switches sides, <laughs> guys getting kind of dizzy yet uh, uh, and again don't try to remember all these all these people just get the sense of what's happening here uh, Jonathan switches to Tryphon and Antiochus the sixth so Tryphon is the actual person in charge he's kind of propping up Antiochus the sixth because Tryphon does not have any royal blood uh, and so Antiochus the sixth confirms the honor that was already bestowed on Jonathan but in addition he also uh, allows for the, let's see if I, yeah. do, do. so you see the green there that comes on, it doesn't show up as the old, old Wells Eagle card. You can see on the map in your, in your uh, notes, the area of green that's there is uh, an area that now um, Simon is made the commander of the Greek forces in that area, okay? So now, so now imagine if you would, let's say, you know, like we're, we're over in Iraq, and we're, you know, fighting against all of those, and there's a group that, that was rebelling. Now we're in favor of them, and, and they're kissing up to us, and so we like them. And uh, as a favor for how well they fought in one of the battles to, for our interests, we, we put one of them in charge, and then we let the other one actually command our forces in that area. So this is a huge honor to, to have Simon be put over those forces, uh, and to build up that, that trust uh, that was there. But it brings great influence now to this little five-brother family that had been nothing but a small-town family that had rose up against uh, these, the, the Greeks. And so Simon, uh, um, he's made general from Tyre to Egypt, uh, like being the joint chiefs of staff to the king. And then Jonathan reaffirms his alliance with Rome at this point. And this is where... I, I was I, I lied to you guys last week because I talked to you guys about the, the letter talking about the Spartans and it's actually this letter when Jonathan is sending it to the Romans uh, to reaffirm the alliance that they had that they also send somebody uh, to the Greeks uh, and to the Spartans and naming them as being actual descendants of Abraham which is again very interesting. So the, so Rome when they send uh, uh, these letters to Rome. There's this favorable response to both Jonathan and Simon. And uh, at this point, so you know, Rome is getting closer and closer to this region. Uh, they're gaining control of, of Turkey. They're gaining control uh, of different areas uh, in Africa. And so having an ally in this area that's notably, notably strong, they actually are interested in. Uh, and so this, uh, they, they, are encouraged that Rome is uh, with them on their side, uh, and then they end up uh, um, expanding their military uh, control and starting to rebuild and get uh, Judea ready. Now, part of the reason that they're 
they feel encouraged is that if for some reason the Greeks come in now to attack them, that gives Rome an excuse to come over and attack Greece, this Greek mm-hmm. kingdom, and Rome actually is wanting to do that. So they feel more emboldened uh, to build up. <coughs> At this time, Tryphon rebels against Alexander the Sixth. So Tryphon was the one who was propping up Alexander the Sixth, and he uh, decides, I don't want to be under him anymore, I want to be the king. Uh, and so he ends up fighting against Tryphon, uh, and he seeks first to eliminate Jonathan, because he realizes Jonathan's going to be one of the strongest supporters. Uh, and so, one, the fact that he wants to do this uh, shows Jonathan's strength and importance. Uh, but then Tryphon, because he had been originally one of those that was working with Jonathan, and Jonathan had interacted with him, he lures Jonathan into a trap. So he's at Ptolemaeus, and he's like, hey, come up here and visit, and we're going to, uh, um, you know, we're going to get along, and it's going to be great. And uh, at first, they're very hesitant. And so then he's like, well, we'll meet near Galilee. They're like, okay. So Jonathan shows up to Galilee with 3,000 troops because he doesn't want to be taken captive. And then Trifon's like, oh, <laughs> you thought that was, we were coming on bad terms. We're here on good terms. You don't need 3,000 troops. Why don't you leave a bunch of those home and let them go home? Let's just go to Ptolemaeus and talk. Okay. So he does. And he goes to Ptolemaeus with far less troops, and they take them all captive. And they imprison Jonathan. And then they demand a ransom of, uh, of silver. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, as you see, he demands, Trifon demands 100 talents of silver. Uh, And he demands that two of Jonathan's sons are brought to him before he will release Jonathan. So Simon uh, does not bring the two sons, if I remember correctly, but he brings the hundred talents of silver. uh, And he pays Trifon the ransom, but he kills Jonathan anyway. Now, Simon knew, in the the record they have, Simon knew the entire time they were going to kill Simon. But he brings the hundred talents of silver so that there's no excuse for him to attack, uh, um, to attack them and say, you, you didn't bring the silver and you didn't have this. So he, he does it knowing his brother is going to die, but he does it so that they don't attack the rest of the people. Now, this is how then Jonathan loses his life. And now Simon, who uh, is the final remaining brother of the five brothers of that original family, he is now the one who, who comes into power. Now we say Simon the first Hasmonean ruler because from this point on, all the Hasmonean rulers are descendants of Simon. So they, all are, they are his kids and it goes down like your typical secession of, of a kingship. It does not go from brother to brother type of thing. Um, and so, uh, so Simon as a person, uh, he actually behaved like a typical Hellenistic king. Now, why is that significant? Because here is the rebel who rebelled against all the Hellenism. He's part of the family that was zealous against it and wouldn't give into it. But you can see by the way that he rules and by what he does that he has himself become Hellenized. So here he's kind of, what, uh, on a government level, he's the, the least Hellenized, but he's actually still quite Hellenized. What that means is that Judea, at the time of Christ... Is, good, is actually very Hellenized. It's, it's, uh, you see the Greek influence being there because this is still 100, you know, 150, 140 years before Jesus is there. And this is already 150 plus years since Alexander the Great. So that's a lot of, of Greek influence uh, that is there. And you'll notice that now because uh, the, the Greeks aren't forcing them to become Greek, but at the same time, you see them now they're now they're fellowshipping with the Greeks they're interacting with them they're allies with them and and that's usually when the influence actually happens uh, all the more I had not forwarded this I'm sorry there we are um so with Simon uh, now uh, he took his high priestly office seriously so when he did uh, function as high priest He did so with all of the correct (coughs) rituals of it. And this is somewhat of where um, uh, Sadduceeism kind of comes in. Sadduceeism was a very secularized version of Judaism uh, and probably had a lot of Greek thought in it. 
Uh, but what Sadducees were most concerned about was following the rituals uh, demanded of the high priest exactly. You had to, you know, put the blood on the toe, you had to put blood on the thumb, you had to put blood on the ear, you had to do all these things. And so, so they went down and they got it all systematized down. So everything had to be perfect within uh, the temple worship, exactly how the law declared it which is a very Greek way of viewing the religious rituals within a temple. Uh, and so that's where the Sadducees start to kind of come out. Uh, we still don't hear of them yet. So this is, we're still at a time right when the Pharisees are developing, the Sadducees are developing, and you still have the Hasidim. They're going to be coming soon, though. Uh, but part of it is this group of who is okay with Simon and this family being high priest and who is not okay with Simon and the family being high priest, that's part of what results in the division of, um, uh, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, he was well regarded by his subjects, so the Jews that were under him, uh, they thought highly of him, uh, and he did have a lot of good qualities, but he also has some bad ones that come out, especially towards the end of his life, and these bad qualities begin to be taken up by his kids. Uh, and they get even worse. You guys will be shocked at some of the behavior uh, that his descendants have. Now, in 142 BC then, uh, when there's a transfer of allegiance to back to supporting Demetrius, they are released from the payment of taxes. Uh, and so 1 Maccabees says, thus the yoke of the heathen was taken away from Israel. Release from taxes means independence. So in 142 BC, Judea becomes an independent state. It is no longer any, under any empire or beholden to that empire as, a, as they have government control. Now that doesn't mean that they aren't influenced by these different things. They'll be influenced by Rome. They'll be influenced by the Greeks. They'll be influenced by Egypt. Um, but they are an independent nation as of 142 B.C., which is why 142 BC is referred to as the first year of Simon, the high priest and governor and the leader of the Jews, rather than being recorded as the 170th year of the Seleucid reign. Uh, and so this is now uh, independent Judea. And this is where a lot of people do not realize that Judea was independent from this time until after the birth of Christ. So it's, it's not being overruled by the Romans in the way we typically think of it as. Now, Simon, as the governor, uh, he uh, he completed the siege of the Acre, um, and so the troops had been removed. There were still some that that uh, that were there because of all of the switching back and forth. Uh, he goes through Jerusalem, and all of the Jews that had been pushing for the Greek culture and the, basically the secular Jews. He kicks them out of Jerusalem, uh, and then he tries to make Jerusalem free of any major Greek influences. Uh, his son, John Hyrcanus, becomes the captain of the people, and he will become eventually uh, one of the rulers. We'll start with him next week. Um, and then Rome once again renews their treaty of friendship with Simon. So I want you guys to check through all of this multiple times. They're in contact with Rome. They are affirming a treaty with Rome. Rome is a friend and a supporter of them. They are a friend and a supporter of Rome uh, during all of this time. So then, uh, at this point, Simon ends up adding uh, more to the Jewish territory. Uh, he captures Gaza. Oops. So he captures Gaza down here, uh, which today is like the Gaza Strip. Uh, and he also takes control of Joppa again. So they now have a port. He expands across into uh, um, into uh, across the the Jordan, and uh, and now this has become not just a priestly state around a city state of Jerusalem. It's becoming a more genuine nation uh, again. Uh, and so then Simon functions as the high priest. Uh, so he was. Um, made the high priest uh, by the Greek, but then there's a Greek synagogue that's held in 141 BC, uh, and it comes together to legitimize this role. So he took on the responsibilities of it, but he, again, he, he put it before the people and said, what do you think? Uh, it was controversial, as I said, because he's, he's from a priestly family, but not from the line of Zadok, uh, and not even from the line of, of I think it was 
Phineas, that it's supposed to be from through uh, Aaron's sons. Um, and then uh, the Jewish tradition had always been to keep the king and the high priest separate. Now, the interesting thing about this is the separation of the priest and the king is that this becomes kind of a hot button issue eventually with the Jews. And they do eventually separate the high priest and the king role when they get to King Herod. Up to that point, they don't. So you, when you get to King Herod, you now have a separate high priest. And that's very, very important to the Jews because they, they pushed and they wanted, they, they did not want those two roles together. And this is part of why you have the argument that's having to be put forward in the book of Hebrews as to how Jesus could be both king from the tribe of Judah, yet high priest through the, the through Melchizedek. And you, you and I sit there like, who cares? Like, in a certain sense, like he's, he's, he's high priest and he's king. Yay, we're all good. Uh, but because it had been such a sensitive issue to the Jews of blending those two positions, it was, nope, nope, that couldn't be the case. And then he, the author of Hebrews has to bring out some of the legitimacy of that. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> the confirmations of contributions to Judea and the temple by the Hasmonean family were noted. So they looked and said, this is, you know, it's a righteous family. They've done all these good things and they've helped with, you know, cleansing the temple and so on and so forth. Uh, and then he was confirmed as high priest and governor until, and this is a key one, until a true prophet uh, appeared. And this is where the book of Maccabees acknowledges that there has not been a prophet since Malachi. And so when we sit down and say, well, how come the writings in between the Old Testament aren't scriptures? Like, none of them raised to the level that they were recognized as uh, being prophetic. Uh, and that's within the book that, you know, someone say, well, this is Maccabees, it's in scriptures. Like, but Maccabees itself, by saying that, is showing it's not a prophetic book. It's not being written by somebody who has a prophetic role. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we don't include it in the Protestant uh, canon of Scripture. So uh, when they made this decision to make him a priest, what was overturned uh, were these two things that uh, having the line have to be from Phineas and the line from Zadok. Now, Demetrius II versus Tryphon is still going on. Demetrius II is captured while he's defending Babylon against the Parthians. Uh, and Tryphon again tries to seek the throne, but is challenged now by Antiochus VII, the son of Demetrius II. <laughs> See, like I said, do not try to remember all of these. Uh, and uh, so, but Simon chooses the side uh, of Antiochus VII. And when he does, uh, Antiochus affirms uh, Simon's authority, uh, and, uh, and he basically affirms him in the high priesthood. Uh, man, I'm flying through this lesson. I could have done a second lesson after this. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, governor, so he, he's affirmed in the high priesthood, and then uh, you have the governor and the ruler of Judea. He's affirmed in that, uh, and, and then he gives, they give him the right to make coinage. Now, you think, well, if they're, if they're no longer under them as an empire, you know, what's, so what about the right uh, to make coinage? By them granting this right, that means, in essence, they're going to open up trade with that. Like, you, you, if you want to take a coin and exchange it for somebody else's coin, they have to legitimize and accept the fact that you have coins. And so this is a way that says he can coin his own stuff, and the international community is going to recognize that coinage. Um, and so it's a further sign of accepting their position of into being independent. Uh, when, however, uh, Simon... Um, ends up confirming uh, his, his relationship with Rome, uh, and Rome declares friendship with the Jews throughout their empire. So this is not just, hey, we have a treaty with you here, but like all throughout the empire, you have a, a, a kind of a favored status. Now uh, the Greek kingdom and Antiochus the, the seventh is not happy with them. So he demands the return of the Hellenistic cities, uh, including the Acre, uh, and the, for, the which is the fortress in Jerusalem, and uh, basically Simon fights against this uh, until the time of his death. So Simon, he's killed by Ptolemaeus, um, his Egyptian son-in-law, who was in charge of Jericho. So he had married off his daughter to uh, um, uh, the Egyptian king's uh, son. And uh, this is the one who kills him and wants to become uh, king. 
uh, he had invited Simon and his sons, uh, uh, not John Hyrcanus, who ends up taking his place, uh, to a banquet and basically ambushes them uh, and has them killed. So, a summary of Simon's life. Uh, he was the last of the sons of Mattathias the Hasmonean, uh, and he uh, brought the revolt to its end, bringing independence to Judea. Uh, he's the first of the Hasmonean rulers. So from this point on, as I said, all of his descendants are, are kings, although, yeah, John Hyrcanus is the first one who's going to take the actual title of king. Uh, up to that point, it's high priest and governor uh, of the area. And then followed... Um, He's basically followed by much lesser men as rulers. So as, as bad as Simon might have been, his sons uh, get much worse. Uh, and then the book of 1 Maccabees then ends at this point. So if you're reading the book of Maccabees, 1 Maccabees ends here because that's the five sons of Mattathias. Uh, and then 2 Maccabees picks up with the descendants of, uh, um, uh, yeah, with the descendants of Simon. So... I said all that in 45 minutes, so we have an extra, extra time. Uh, and uh, so do you guys, the, the, the key things that you want to get out of this time period, um, one is that the, this expansion is happening kind of through diplomacy. You're not seeing these big victorious battles anymore. And... And, and there aren't things within this that start to go, oh, God was really working there. God was really working there. This gets more, I guess, is the earthly and how it's expanding and how it's going. And it will get more and more that way uh, as it goes on. Uh, and so that, and then you'll also see um, another big emphasis here is just how much the, the ones who were rebelling against the Hellenizing were becoming Hellenized themselves and catering to the Hellenized, uh, Hellenizing rulers, even though they were still against uh, uh, the official Hellenization. So, all right. Any questions that you guys have? It's all new, because <laughs> we have it in the Catholic Bible, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where I wish we still put it in into our Bibles, but there's a way to do that without people then thinking it's, you know, well, this is the same level as the rest of Scripture. Because being ignorant of a lot of this stuff has caused a lot of problems. Um, the other thing I wish that there was something in the Bible about is um, 70 AD, which we're going to get to eventually when, uh, when Jerusalem is destroyed. Because almost all of Scripture was written before that happened. And uh, there are even some that would say the book of Revelation was written before that happened. And that's kind of debated uh, here and there. But 70 AD ended up being such a, a vastly important historical event, yet we have so little of it, and most Christians, especially in the West, know so little about it at all. Uh, but it factors a great deal. It fulfills a ton of prophecy. So it's there in Scripture. It's just we don't have the account of it in Scripture. To have lived <laughs> through all this mm -hmm. would have been incredible. There yeah. was no stability. You never knew who was going to be the ruler the next day or who was going to get killed. It, you know, it, it, it was a very uh, upheaval uh, of time. Yes. It must have been awful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's there, there's, to some extent, as is almost the case in any time period of history, mm -hmm. um, this is more drastic in the bigger cities. Mm -hmm. If you're in the country, you know, all you're worried about is how mm -hmm. my tax is going to go up. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but when you're, when, you know, because you're not in the major area, it's going to get attacked. You're not important for control. No one's going to take that little, mm -hmm. you know, village typically, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a, that distinction between those. But. So... Yes. Can I go back to last week and ask a question? <laughs> Absolutely. And we have plenty of time this okay. week to go into all of that stuff if we want to. When you were talking about this, the serpents and, and Satan being thrown out, and there was a, 
and now, you know, in hindsight, I can't remember exactly the, the, the discussion, but it was like there was a confusion as to who the serpent was and when he was thrown out or when Satan was thrown out. And can you kind of maybe explain that a little better? Yeah, so um, the typical picture of Satan's fall, at least when I would say I grew up thinking I, I knew, um, is that prior to the creation of the world, there was a war in heaven where Satan rebelled. When he rebelled, uh, I think they even say a third of the angels went with him, uh, and he had had a special role there in heaven. Uh, the reason he fell out that I was usually told was from Isaiah 14, the five thy wills of Satan, I will ascend to the hill of the Lord, I will you know, do certain things. Um, and that uh, he fell, and uh, when he fell, he was cast down, and he now kind of dwells in hell, and dwelling in hell issues forth to come out and do whatever he can to mess up God's people, and that he has a whole group of angels with him called uh, demons. And, uh, and these demons, you know, from the very beginning, uh, as soon as the world was created, wanted to thwart things, so Satan then inhabited the serpent and caused, you know, brought about the fall. Um, and then, you know, all throughout, you know, history, then you have Satan who's, you know, doing these various different things. Uh, and so um, what I began to realize as I was started to really dive into this, like, I want to know what's going on. And, and part of that was because of my own questions about it. Part of it was because, you know, as a pastor, you get asked a lot of questions. Um, but part of it was just language because you're sitting there, you're learning. And for instance, you learn Hebrew and you get to the word uh, Satan, which is we get Satan from. Out of the, all the times that it's used in the Old Testament, most of the times it's being used of, of a human or being used in, in different ways. So for instance, the word Hebrew word Satan um, is is used of the angel who stands in the way of Balaam mm -hmm. uh, because he's an adversary to Balaam and he says I have you know I've come to be a satan to you an adversary to you uh, by standing in front of you um, when David is um, uh, fleeing because of uh, Absalom and Shammai comes out and curses him and his two soldiers are like you know, and by the way, you're, you're getting into my next sermon, so sorry about that. But um, the, the two soldiers, you know, are, are in the two commanders, they're like, we should put Shemai to death. And he says, why are you being a Satan to me? Why are you being an adversary to me and wanting to kill more people today? Um, and this is where it's going to factor into the next passage we have in Matthew, where Jesus turns to Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Because I've heard people say, oh, that's when Satan entered into Peter. And it was like, He's saying, don't be an adversary to me. Don't don't go be against me in this time. Like uh, Almost like, I need you behind me. Uh, which when he says, you know, get thee behind me, is he saying, you know, get out of here? Or is he saying, fall in line. Get, get behind what I'm doing. Get behind what I'm saying. Don't be an adversary. Which is more, I believe, of what he's actually saying. But because we, we automatically take the word Satan and just go, well, that's Satan. And we, we, we jump to that. On top of that, many times when Satan is used, it's used like the word enemy. Enemy, I can say it's singular, but I'm referring to the enemy. And, uh, and grammatically, that's how it's used often. Uh, it will be taken by a plural uh, object after it and such like that. So you, some of it's just the grammar. You start to realize, you know, Satan isn't really like that. And then the word diabolos, which we translate as devil, means uh, uh, the accuser. And it's used almost the exact same way as Satan is mm -hmm. in the Hebrew in the Greek. So it's when you go in the adversary in court that you have the diabolos. It's, it's the one uh, who is, is the accuser. Then you start to dive into it and you start to look at all those times in Hebrew. The times that Satan uh, is used um, in Job and in Zechariah, it's used with what's called the article. So the word the. So it's the Satan. And it's very clearly an individual angelic being. So in Job and in Zechariah, it's very clear this is angelic, but it, it has that very clear, the adversary. 
And so, uh, you know, then it factors in uh, to like the passage where David um, counts his men because in, in Kings and Chronicles in the two accounts, one says the Lord uh, um, tested David and provoked him to count his men. And then in the other one, other account, it says, and Satan arose and caused David to count his men. But what you realize is an adversary arose, and that adversary is given to you just a little bit later. So you can see how there's a tendency that you see Satan, and you put in Satan, and then you know, we just talk about Satan, and, and you start to see that. So then you get into the New Testament, and it's like, well, how much of that impacted how we've understood all the occurrences in the New Testament as well? That this is the adversary. Now, it's still talking about the spiritual adversaries and the adversaries to the kingdom, but is it always talking about the individual? Like, when you, you need to know the wiles of Satan, or you need to know how he works, is that, is that you need to know how Satan, the individual being, works, or do you need to know how the enemy all works together? Uh, and so it's it's kind of, it's it's just realizing not to not to automatically go to the singular being, not saying that there's not a singular being, because like you because you have the one in Job, you have the one in Zechariah, you have the serpent that was in in, in Genesis. So there is a singular being who is, and, and the biggest thing about the what's mentioned in Gen, uh, Revelation is that he, um, I think it's Revelation, it might be said elsewhere, where he's referred to as the father of lives. Mm -hmm. But what you begin to see is Satan's biggest role is is deception mm -hmm. and the ac accusing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's just different than what we typically picture it as. And the main way he's thrown out of heaven then is that he's no longer able to accuse the brethren. And so when it when so if you take Satan then and you say what was what what's the fall? Was he was it a fall from heaven and when did that happen? Well he's in heaven in Job. He's in heaven in Zechariah, because both of those he's in the presence of God before the throne of God, accusing uh, Job or accusing Joshua the high priest. So he's not thrown down from heaven at that point. Uh, and then you get to Revelation 12, and it says that in Revelation 12, and this is after the child that the dragon tried to eat or, or tried to consume was taken up, that after that there was war in heaven, and the accuser of our brethren was thrown down. And so because of the cross, he can no longer be in heaven accusing us. And so his fall from heaven is more then if you were to go just what's said in scripture. And so he otherwise had a role there all the way through. Um, and it's just different than what we typically think of. And so it's it's just kind of just kind of getting our minds into what scripture actually says instead of what all of our literature has said uh, over the years. Yeah. Yeah, I thought uh, God asked Satan what he was doing when he was going to before he was uh, tempting Job, he said he was roaming to and fro. Yeah, about the earth. Yeah. Yeah, but he but he then goes back up to heaven to offer his accusations and and, and that's what he seems to be. He seems to be somebody who's like going around seeing things and coming to God and going, How are you letting this one be blessed? Why are you letting this one be like, well look at this this person, have you seen what they've done? And there's that that accusing that's that's going on. And this is why when it says, you know, in, in Romans, like if Christ is standing at the right hand of the Father, who can accuse you? That's done, and you, you, and that's one of the beauties of that. It's like it's like that's all finished, and nothing can be accused. Uh, when it says, for instance, that the the slavery the Egyptian had rose up to where God knows it, you know, like there's this is one of the weirdest things for me. It's like, okay, he's omniscient. Why did he even make angels? But is there that sense of the angels are they're still there? You know. Don't do this to the children because their angels are ever before my father. Well, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean just no. Uh, and so there's this role that angels play, whether we think that they're not needed because of his omniscience. It's, it's the way that God decided to create reality where the angels are the ones bringing a lot of that information that's there before throne. And that's the picture of scripture gives us. Uh, and so this idea of Satan being out and, and seeing those things and like coming before him and accusing and, and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of the function that they have, even amongst us as humans, is giving us all of our thoughts that are accusing. I think when Satan uh, has some of his greatest way is when he gets into our minds and gets us 
thinking all of those thoughts that accuse this person, accuse that person, accuse that person, when we should be having mercy and, and such toward them. But. Okay. <laughs> can Satan read our minds? If he's in our minds, can he read our minds? Does he know what we're thinking? I don't think he can read our minds, but I, but he knows humans well enough by now. Is it the knowledge of good and evil that makes yeah. us think or have guilt and things like that, and we should no longer have guilt because Jesus died for our sins? Well, the knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil is what allows us to be deceived and have guilt that we shouldn't have because even what we're doing isn't wrong. Um, and, and the knowledge of good and evil is what allows us to think that something is good. I, so I feel that Satan's fall from goodness, which is different than his fall from heaven, his fall from goodness, and, the, and I have hardly anything to support this, so don't think I'm teaching this doctrine. It's just, but but there, there are things that, that I would say go, go behind it. Was when he, and whether he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil himself, I don't know. I, I, it's a total mystery. Like, why is, is he, is this an angelic being in the serpent? You know what's what's going on, but uh, but the there is a sense of where he realized if I can get Eve or, or man to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that will open them up to be deceived, and I can be their god. I can deceive them into worshiping me, uh, and so I feel that that was part of what was behind his. Uh, is doing that, or if he opened, he he ate and was like, you know, once he had a different view of good and evil than God did, he's like, God is is limiting them. I feel that um, <laughs> this out really weird. I feel that Satan in some ways thinks he's doing what's good by setting people free from the tyranny of God's law, mm -hmm. uh, and he is the ultimate of lawlessness, uh, and. Uh, there, you know, and that's where you know one thing in um, Milton's Paradise Lost, which shapes a lot of our idea of Satan, is he says as Satan gets down to the hell, and it's like better, um, better to be uh, free and be in hell than to be a slave, enslaved and be in heaven. Mm -hmm. Is that what a lot of atheists? But you're a slave no matter which. You're either a slave to Christ or you're a slave to. Yes, yes, and and that's. And the thing is, is like, what is happening in heaven is goodness. And that's, and that's the biggest issue. So what you have to do is be able to interrupt somebody's ability to know good and evil correctly, or according to God, and then you can deceive them that something else is good. And that's why the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is actually in that, that ability to discern good and evil on our own is the very core of our sinful. And so we then can now feel good about an action and feel righteous about an action that's actually wrong. And I can even feel guilty about an action that's not even wrong because my knowledge of good and evil is messed up. And I just think somehow Satan, being the wiliest of all the creatures and whatever, however that all worked in, knew that and saw that opportunity. Um, but then you get down to like, well, where did all the other ones come from? All the other demons. And it's like, that's the that's the difficulty part because we have this like just all of a sudden a third of the demons went you know hey we're with this guy and it's like <laughs> no that's not and and again the third of the stars that it talks about in Revelation probably isn't even talking about that um, and then what you have instead being portrayed in Genesis is that the sons of God came down and left what we know from Jude they left their place in heaven that was the correct place and they came down and it seems on a individual basis. They came down and they made these relationships with the daughters of men and have these children. And they, I, I feel what it was is that because of the knowledge of good and evil and Satan being able uh, to, to lead them away, others, other spiritual beings realized, I, we can become their gods. We can get them to worship up us. And that's how the pagan gods started. I think that there was an actual reality. I think that people actually had interactions with these spiritual beings that set up the beginning of, of the pagan myths. Uh, and so when you have an interaction prior to the flood, they're, they're creating these, these children that are these, these heroes, and, and the people are calling them gods. But then eventually what happens is the flood occurs, 
And then Peter tells us that all the spirits from before the flood are locked in Tartarus, in, in, in prison. Well, then where did the new ones come from? And that's why I, I mentioned last week that, that there seems to be, is it's possible that the fall can be, of spiritual beings, can be ongoing. And I have no idea if this is what Paul meant when he said, talk about the hair thing and said, you know, for the sake of the angels, like, is there some way that that impacts them? Because, I mean, there's just a lot of, you know, things in there. Now, I, I, I say this just, just because, not, not so much that, oh, I, oh, I found out this is the way that it is. It's more of a lot of the stuff I thought was just set and solid, I, I don't find there. And then as I started looking through, there actually seems to be a much different picture being created of that whole world. And one of the interesting things is all the in all the Old Testament, the word demon occurs twice. One, Israelites worshiping goat demons at Mount Sinai. Another one later, talking about demons being in an area that was destroyed and wiped out by an army, if I'm remembering correctly. Otherwise, it's always the, the other gods, these so-called gods, these other gods. Then you get to the New Testament, and it's all demons, and you hear almost nothing about the other gods. And that's, I feel, because the Jews have come to belittle the other gods by referring to them as demons. Because a demon, a demon in, in Greek, um, is not evil in just in the Greek language and the Greek culture. A demon would be like a fawn or a satire, a spirit of the forest, somebody that was a lesser spirit that had control. And that's actually what they primarily worship. You know the stacking stones that people do when you're hiking? Mm -hmm. That was a way of acknowledging the spirits of the forest. And, and, mm -hmm. and that's why I knock them down every time I walk by. But it's like there's, 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 the, you know, there's that, that, um, that idea of the demons were these, these lesser gods. And so when Paul says when they worship these other gods, they're worshiping demons, he's insulting them. He's, he's, saying, he's saying, look, those aren't true gods. They're these lesser gods, these little gods. Um, but we're never told in Scripture how they all fall. We're never told what happens. We're never told when it happens. We're never told uh, a chronology of it. We're never told any of that stuff. And so I, I don't bring this up to say dive into it and find out because you're not going to be able to find out. It's not there. And if it's not given in Scripture, it's not important to our, our walk, and it shouldn't be. I say that because people will get caught up in this, and they'll get caught up in Satan and warfare prayer and all this other stuff. They get going all the way, and they say all this stuff as though they know all what's happening. I talked with Frank Peretti once. How many of you guys have seen Frank Peretti's books or heard of, any, heard of Frank oh, Peretti's yeah. books? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This I present darkness, that. piercing the darkness, things like that. Yeah. I talked with him one time, and it was he, he said he said it really shocked me. He's like. And, and I let it get get to my own ego. He's like, I wrote these books entirely fiction. Oh wow! And I started, and, and, and he he knew they were fiction. They're just fictional stories, but they're about the spiritual warfare. And then he started being called to churches to speak on spiritual warfare, and started to speak on it. And people were, I mean, there were entire ministries built up off of the stuff that he had created in these books. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, you know, I got all caught up in it, and, and God really convicted me. Like. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't even be doing that. And but yet that happens. And that's where we have to be careful not to go beyond what's written, not to go beyond what scripture has, uh, and and to search things out, search things out ourselves, find out, you know, what it actually says. You know, if you guys the stuff I'm saying, oh man, you're full of it, Dwayne. I don't know what in the world you're talking about, where you get well then go go dive in and and find it all yourself and come tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> So I know you'll do it. No, uh, but no, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, but it's 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 the and that and that's half of the, the half reason why I don't mind having the conversation because I want us to be driven to scripture mm -hmm. to see what's actually there and let that base our our, our positions on. So. Well, there are some scriptures that are very clear about what Satan is. He's the father of lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's like a roaring lion that prowls around to see whom he can devour. Mm -hmm. And so those things we can be sure of. That, yep. And that he's a real person. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you kind of just need to recognize that's good enough <laughs> to yeah. understand because yeah. that's what, what Scripture has made clear. Right. And, and, the, and the, just realizing, just realizing that in, in him being a person, 
we're never supposed to go and interact with him. I had a guy that mm-hmm. told me he had golf with Satan and that it was his calling to battle Satan every day for the sake of work, Lord's Christianity. Mm-hmm. He was going to keep Satan at bay. Well, you know, and I'm like, no. How much no. drugs are you on? He was on a few. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it, it's just kind of, it's kind of like, but in, in, in my biggest concern is that the people that get caught up in the spiritual warfare stuff, it's really plain in Ephesians. How do we fight against flesh? These, you know, we don't fight against flesh and blood, against these principalities and powers. How? Prayer. By breastplate of righteousness. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's just it's by walking with the mm-hmm. Lord and praying. Mm-hmm. That's it. But not praying like praying against. I mean, I, I have been at events where people walk around and cast demons out of chairs. Mm-hmm. Demons don't care about chairs. They're not in chairs. Mm-hmm. They, they're not. They're not embodying things like that. It's not understanding at all. Mm-hmm. Um, what what is going on here nor the fact that we should not be worried about the demon in the chair i should be praying about the holy spirit in the soul uh that's that's where my concern is so can you now there have been times when i have um felt a presence Mm -hmm. against me and i have uh prayed by the power of the blood of jesus Mm -hmm. that this uh this spirit or whatever it is that would be would be um, removed, mm-hmm. and that's not wrong, is it? I mean, because uh, I mean, and that spirit did leave. What, what I say, what I say, is not it's not wrong to turn to to the spirit and and do that. I mean, I have encountered, I have had uh, about three three definite, for sure, occurrences of dealing with somebody who is demon possessed, mm-hmm. uh, and and so. Um, and I hated every one of them. Mm-hmm. It's, you feel so weird. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. no, like this is so, you know, you know. But but you 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 encounter some of those things. Um, one time, it was just leading the person to Christ. The moment they trusted in Christ, gone. As a seven year old boy, he couldn't have faked mm-hmm. it. Uh, and uh, you know, another one it was just just voices. There was nothing really dramatic. It was just voices that he couldn't get out of his head when he accepted mm-hmm. Christ. Voices stopped. The other one, that's a long story, is there were two of us dealing with it, and the other guy uh, approached it purely from psychology mm-hmm. and would not allow us to approach it as a spiritual issue, and mm-hmm. it created, it, it's a weird story that would take in mm-hmm. some for over coffee, and I don't like to do it in a teaching mm-hmm. situation, but um, they're there. Mm-hmm. The thing is, they, they don't get a lot out of just, uh, you know, controlling people. It's, it's, they, they want you to get fascinated with them. Mm-hmm. And I and I I had a couple one time that went to a conference on prophecy, went to a conference on spiritual warfare, and then somehow after that, they both experienced this dark presence, like a cloud in the room. And when they walked through it, it was cold. And, da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. and I'm like, hmm, you know, what, what goal do you think the enemy would have making a cloud in your room? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what, what do you... What's he doing? But what he's doing is, is he's trying to get them distracted. Mm-hmm. Get or them into all of those things. Uh, yeah. Make you be fearful as well. Fear, fearful, mm-hmm. but then, yeah. but I mean, yeah. I, I like, <laughs> uh, at the last church, Jerry did a series on, on spiritual warfare that went too far in some mm-hmm. aspects. And a lady came in, she was scared to death to go to her daughter's house because she had a Buddha statue mm-hmm. in her house and she couldn't stay the night there. Because that Buddha statue might bring a curse down. And then, mm-hmm. and I said, look, my daughter said something very profound once. She said, Dad, I feel really bad for all those other gods. And I'm like, why is that? Because mm-hmm. every time their followers bow down to them, our God's in the way. <laughs> I, I mean, the answer is, our God is so powerful. Mm-hmm. These gods are nothing. I have nothing mm-hmm. to fear. There, there is nothing a demon could do to me. Mm-hmm. I, the, I, honestly, if, if God is for me, who can be against me? If Christ mm-hmm. is at the right hand of the Father, Believers who can be trying. against me? It's, it's like there is absolutely positive. Mm-hmm. So there's if, I, if I'm walking through some place, I mean, I don't like the dark. Don't get me wrong. I'll run out of this building if it's dark and I'm alone. That's <laughs> not, that's that's a whole other thing. But but I'm not like scared of some demon coming out and, and attacking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there, there's a there's there's that sense of just confidence in knowing that. But if they can create a fear and a fascination that distracts you. They, they will. Mm-hmm. They will. And, and we have to often be careful of those mm-hmm. things uh, because the scripture never portrays it as that nice, dramatic, cool.
cool mm -hmm. spiritual warfare thing. Spiritual mm -hmm. warfare is obeying Christ. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Any other final questions? Yes. Um, I don't know if you were saying this on based on fact or opinion, but the whole like Greek myth, Greek mythology and that led to like paganism and witchcraft mm -hmm. and all that. Like, were those gods and goddesses like real at one time, and then due to Christ and everything in history, like it just it's not anymore. Well, no. They were I'm just real. Confused. They were real. Okay. They are real. Okay. Okay. Now, are the myths real? Mm -hmm. No. Um, are they? Are they the gods as you know as men has made them out to be in the stories? No. But they are not fake gods. They're false gods, and that's different. A false god means somebody, an actual thing that actually exists, pretending to be a god falsely. But they're not. A fake god is the humans are pretending the god's there and there's nothing there. Paul's very plain. When they worship these gods, they are worshiping demons. So there is an entity that is behind every one of these gods. They have influenced things. If you read through, how many of you guys have ever read through various of the you know, Iliad, Odyssey, different pagan I stuff? I read the Odyssey. Yeah, you, you'll, Only you'll, when you'll, my professors made me. If you look at a lot of what they're saying, the way that these gods manifest themselves typically is going to be to manifest themselves in and through a warrior on the battlefield, in and through a, a, a person and a, another human being. Um, and uh, I'll go, I'll go really, I'll weird you guys out really bad. Have I already done that? <laughs> but, uh, I'll weird you out a little bit. And this again, this is all, this is all the conjecture stuff because we are not not told. But one of the questions that came to my mind is, okay, wait a minute. If these gods all did this before the flood and then the flood destroyed everybody, but then the Nephilim continued after that because they were, they were directly connected all that line to the Goliath. So Goliath is part of the, the, the um, uh, what's the name of the, there's a, there's a family and then that's connected to the Nephilim and the Nephilim are connected, but that's after the flood. So how could that uh, have been that way? Uh, and that's just what my brain does not just accept things. So it just has to keep asking questions. And so I kept thinking about that. And what you see in a lot of the pagan practices is that the gods would inhabit the body of the priest at the temple, which is why you have cultic prostitution mm -hmm. that is constantly going. Within all of those pagan things, what you would basically do is you would go in and you would take a whole lot of good drugs or they put uh, psychedelic drugs in, a, um, in something that would fill the room with the, the smoke. And in that, you would then have uh, basically a relationship with one of the priests, and then the god was supposed to channel into that. Now, if if you have that happening and a child is conceived, we now know what, what we would call um, genetic modification is possible. Now, if the angels knew about all that stuff and understood all that stuff, if they could go down and modify the child that is being born through natural things, they're not creating a new life only god can do that but they're using their uh supernatural powers to impact some of those so that they make sure that this child that's born is very tall very strong very you know big and, and everything else like that then that genetics could actually still have survived through the flood through noah's daughters daughter-in-laws and and such so there's there's things like that 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 are there but then what that means is that then you start reading through some of the pagan myths and there's like, there's a strong correspondence with almost all these pagan myths where there's, they have a period where the gods are coming, you know, down and they're doing all the stuff and then there's a flood. I mean, there's a commonality with all of these mm -hmm. pagan myths. It's pretty astounding. Um, and they're not exact, but you would not expect them all to have a, a similar pattern. They actually, a lot of them have a similar pattern of long, long lives before the flood and then shorter lives after the flood. Uh, so I, I feel that there is a reality back there that's not at, at, all, at all represented in the myths. The myths have twisted and, and, and whatnot, um, but there's a reality somewhere there because even uh, Peter, in referring to the angel before the flood being put into Tartarus, is like what is said about some of the gods at that time. So it's, there's more there than, than, we, than we think of, and 
Um, and I think we in the Western world have just gotten to where all those gods are fake and it's just not real because now we're, we're scientists and, and we, don't, we don't believe in any of that, um, which they're probably tickled pink about. Um, but those spiritual realities are there. And th this is why, no, it's not okay to play around with a Ouija board. No, it's not okay to, to do tarot cards. No, it's not okay to play around with magic stuff because it's not just fake in a game from Hasbro. It's, it's evil <laughs> and it has a reality behind it. Uh, but we've lost that in a lot of our, our things. And, and now witchcraft has become something that's a, a awesome movie chain that everybody knows what house they're in because they've gone to the website to figure out it, you know? <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's, you know, I, I, guilty as charged, sorry on that one. Uh, <laughs> but it's just, a, it's, that's, that's where it's become. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, we definitely live in a world that has all of those forces, but there's that balance between knowing that and then looking and going, if this is the case, why doesn't the Bible tell us more? Because we don't need to know more. Because we're not supposed to get focused on that. We're not supposed to get caught up in that. Uh, we're not supposed to, that's why Colossians says, you know, the people who get caught up in all their visions and, and stuff from angels and no, no, we have Christ and we don't need to be doing that. So, um, that's why a lot of this, you know, different stories is like, why share those? Why talk about those? They, they use scripture, go to scripture. So, all right, 732. Some of you may want to get out, it's going early, but I'll hang out for a little bit longer if you guys want to. Uh, ask some more questions, but I want to give a chance for those to vamoose if you're like, I really don't want any more of this tonight. <laughs> so, uh, anybody want to get up and yeah, serious? There you go. He's like, I gotta <laughs> work in one, the morning. One. <laughs> I have learned that not everybody enjoys all those conversations, and even if they do, that not they. Well, I was going to also say, I kind of went down the rabbit hole at one point. Um, and I was given a book called Defeating Dark Angels by Charles Crabb. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've ever read it. Uh -uh, no. uh, it's a good book. Um, and the guy is speaking from a legitimate standpoint. I mean, to be honest with you, he's saying a lot of things you said today. It kind of like throws me off, and especially now you're saying you don't even read the book. You know, it's even more interesting. Um, so yeah, just just don't tell me the rest of his stuff is heresy, because that'll make me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would check it out. I mean, it was just... Yeah. Dark angels, yeah. 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 All right, so yeah, we'll give them about five minutes, five minute breaks so that people can can head out without feeling awkward. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're on first. <laughs> oh, hey, that's not